The ingot is the usual starting point for the products of the rolling mills. Ingots are cast in individual moulds as large blocks, usually of square or rectangular cross-section. They're placed in a soaking pit to attain an even rolling temperature throughout. They are then rolled backwards and forwards in a primary mill to reduce them to slab or bloom form. processes are still carried on, but alongside them, a more economical technique is coming into common use, the technique of continuous casting. It's called continuous casting because molten steel from a ladle is fed through a tundish into an open-ended mould. In the mould, it's cooled sufficiently to acquire its shape with a thin, solid shell, but it passes straight through to further cooling zones, emerging finally as a long and completely solid strand. This strand is then cut to shorter lengths, producing what are, metallurgically speaking, ingots. But they're ingots already in the shape of blooms or slabs, with regular cross-section and smooth surfaces. As a result, Soaking and primary rolling are unnecessary. Time, money and plant are saved. The equipment in a typical continuous casting machine is as follows. A ladle with up to 300 tonnes of molten steel from the furnace will release it through a nozzle into a refractory lined tundish immediately below. This is best thought of as a reservoir and funnel guiding the steel at a constant rate into the curved mould. This mould, where primary cooling takes place, is fitted with a cooling jacket through which water is pumped. The steel contracts as it cools, so the mould is slightly tapered to maintain good contact with the steel. Beneath the mould is the secondary cooling zone, where the solidifying steel is prevented from bulging by an arrangement of support rolls, and water is sprayed directly onto its surface. Further down, the rolls act as guides rather than supports. The water sprays are not applied so intensively to the surface of the steel. After the secondary cooling zone comes the withdrawal gear. Large driven rolls which grip the now solid strand and control its descent through the machine, after which a roller is brought into action to straighten the steel strand. And beyond the withdrawal apparatus is the cutting and stacking gear. The casting plant from mould to withdrawal gear is curved. The curve of the strand, which has a radius of about 10 metres, is introduced by the mould and retained as far as the withdrawal rolls. The curved mould is a development from earlier moulds which were straight and vertical, and the cut-off was made on the vertical strand. Because this needed tall plants, bend discharge was introduced, where the issuing strand was bent into the horizontal passed between rollers and straightened again before cut-off. The curved mould technique removes the need for bend discharge and makes for a more compact design. For simplicity, we've been looking in side view at the plant arrangement for a single strand. If the apparatus is turned through 45 degrees, we can see the actual arrangement in the bloom casting machine. One ladle and two tundishes supply eight moulds and produce eight strands simultaneously. These strands may be of several different sizes to suit the final product mix. The mould, seen here from above, is about 60 centimetres deep and is made of four separate plates of high conductivity copper, one for each side. Towards the top of each, there's a recess, the oiling ring. Lubricant is pumped through this during casting to prevent the steel from sticking to the mould. Cooling water is brought to the mould through flexible hoses and passes through the channels present in each plate.
Before casting begins, the bottom of the mould is blocked by a so-called dummy bar. This has a dummy head, a block of steel with a deep curved groove in it, attached to a flexible bar in the form of a giant bicycle chain. The bar extends down through the casting plant, up a ramp behind the withdrawal gear, and is connected by a cable to a winch. In the bottom of the mould, steel chills are placed to speed up the solidification of the first of the molten steel. Casting then begins. Molten steel from the ladle runs through the tundish into the mould and down to the dummy head. As it solidifies, the metal which runs into the groove in the dummy head forms an effective link between the cast strand and the dummy bar. As the metal level comes to within 12 centimetres of the top of the mould, a sensing device detects it and initiates two events automatically and simultaneously. The mould begins to oscillate, so preventing the strand from sticking to it. The withdrawal rolls are activated and begin to draw the dummy bar slowly downwards, trailing the cooling, solidifying strand behind it. Here, all the action is speeded up. The speed of oscillation exceeds the speed of withdrawal by 20% in order to ensure an effective stripping action. The sensing device in the mould also controls the withdrawal speed throughout casting, so that the optimum metal level is maintained in the mould, even if the rate of flow from the tundish fluctuates. As the strand begins to emerge from the withdrawal rolls, the heavy straightening roller is brought into action. Soon afterwards, the dummy head is disconnected by pivoting the ramp up which the dummy bar has been drawn. This makes a clean break and leaves the end of the strand with a claw-like projection. The strand then moves on to be cut to length. Now let's see how it all works in practice. A furnace is tapped to provide a ladle of molten steel. The ladle moves forward to a sampling position. And here two sampling lances and a pyrometer are immersed in the molten metal. The pyrometer records the temperature. The samples will be sent to the quality control labs for analysis to establish accurately the composition of the steel. Meanwhile, the ladle moves on to the rinsing station. Here, a hollow lance is immersed in the steel. Nitrogen is blown through this at a gentle rate. This inert gas rinsing, or flushing, equalizes the temperature throughout the ladle, an important precaution to prevent breakouts in the casting machine. Once flushing has started, the temperature is checked with a manual pyrometer. Further samples are taken, and these too are sent to the quality control lab to ensure that the steel meets the required specifications. At the end of flushing, the temperature is checked again. For most qualities, the steel must be between 1580 and 1605 degrees centigrade for efficient continuous casting. In some cases, accelerated cooling may be necessary. When the temperature is right, the ladle moves on to the casting area. Here, it's lowered gently onto the platform of a ladle car to one side of the line of mould. Once it's in position, the hydraulic mechanism for opening the sliding gate nozzles is connected up. Meanwhile, the two tundishes are under preheat. They stand on a tundish car at one side of the mould. Their nozzles have been temporarily sealed with steel discs. The ladle car now carries the ladle into position directly above the mould. In the moulds themselves, the dummy bar assembly and steel chills have been placed in position. The tundishes now move in from the side on their car. They've remained under preheat until the last possible moment to minimise their cooling effect on the steel when casting begins. Once the tundishes are in position, the sliding gate nozzles on the ladle are open. The carbon plugs, previously inserted, 
are burned through with an oxygen lance. The steel begins to flow. When the metal reaches the appropriate level in the tundishes, their nozzles too are opened by burning through the steel discs. The molten metal now flows directly into the mould. As its level rises, the mould begins to oscillate. Simultaneously, below, the withdrawal rolls begin to draw the dummy bar down. The winch begins to pull it slowly up the dummy bar ramp. The casting process is now established. It continues automatically, but its progress is supervised by four operators, each responsible for two moulds. Their job is to keep the moulds and their oilways clean, free from build-ups of slag and solid metal, though in some moulds, slag powder is added as a lubricant instead of oil. In any given cast, strands of several different sizes may be formed. The appropriate flow of steel to each mould is obtained by using tundish nozzles of different sizes. The bigger the mould, the bigger the nozzle. The strand takes about half an hour to pass through the cooling zones, and its progress is followed in the control room. On this plant, there are eight identical control panels, one for each strand. Various aspects of the casting process are monitored and regulated. The temperature of the mould cooling water is recorded. The rate of water flow is shown. Rate of oscillation, casting speed, tundish temperature, and casting time. The strand descends through the machine at a rate controlled by the withdrawal gear. By the time it reaches the rolls, it's completely solid. The dummy bar is drawn by its winch up the ramp behind the withdrawal rolls. As the curved strand emerges from the withdrawal rolls, the straightening roller is brought down onto it. A few moments later, the dummy head is disconnected. The dummy bar ramp is tilted, and the joint between strand and dummy head is cleanly broken. The way is thus cleared for the strand to pass on to the cutters. These are oxypropane burners, one on each strand, mounted on a movable assembly. The assembly clamps onto the strand and moves with it during cutting, so ensuring a square cut. These operations are all automatic, but a manual override is available if required. Cutting can be controlled from a pulpit spanning the rollerway. The claw end of the strand containing the chills is removed first. The burner then moves back to a predetermined position and clamps on again to begin cutting the first required length. The cut length is, in size and shape, a bloom, but it does not have the bloom's physical properties because it's not yet been rolled. This will come later in the secondary rolling mills. Products can also be formed in slab shape in a two-strand slab casting machine. Casting need not stop when a ladle is empty. While there's still metal in the tundishes, the empty ladle is moved away on its car and a second full one moves quickly in to take its place. This is called sequence casting. It removes the need for all the preparation of the tundishes and moulds that we've already seen. Thus, it enables a very high production rate to be achieved, which makes the process ideally suited for bulk orders. In addition, there's very little waste with continuous casting, so 
so yields are higher. The products have good surface quality and regular cross-section, and there's economy of plant. It's techniques like continuous casting that point the way to the highly organized and highly productive steel manufacturing techniques of the future. <laughs>